Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are delighted to be here tonight with Michelle Miller Fisher and Amber Winnick, um, two co editors of Designing Motherhood. Um, first, I'll introduce Michelle. Michelle is a curator and, ar and architecture and design historian. She is the Ronald C. and Anita L. Warnick Curator of Contemporary Decorative Arts at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. She lectures frequently on design, people, and the politics of things. And she's on Instagram, and I'll put her Instagram handle in the chat. Amber Winnick is a writer, design historian, and recipient of two Fulbright Awards. She has lived, researched, and written about family and child-related designs, policies, and practices around the world. So um, welcome to you both. Um, I was saying in the green room that MIT Press, uh, who published this book, is really one of our favorite presses. And mm -hmm. um, they do such innovative, cool feminist thinking. Um, and a lot of people don't know that. So um, I'm wondering, I'm going to, I'm going to get out of the way, but I, I'm wondering if maybe you'll start out by telling folks a little bit about how you came to MIT, um, because many, many people don't realize, I think people have a false idea of MIT, their <laughs> politics, all of that. And MIT really does this wonderful intersectional work um, and really interesting stuff, particularly about design, um, information, technology, all these things. So um, when we saw this physical book we were just so delighted it's a beautiful yeah. book um and it's so cool so i hope folks who are watching at home um will get a chance to actually physically see it because it's really neat um but yeah welcome thanks so much for being here and um thanks to everybody uh for for hanging out uh at home while we uh got ready tonight thank you so much er we're so delighted to be here Yes, absolutely. Amber, maybe do you want to start off by talking about how we came to MIT? Because that's such a nice, nice place to start. And also, sure, yeah, it's a great how story to have this book. Yeah, it's a wonderful story. Um, and uh, I guess Michelle and I met in uh, what was it, 2015, 16? 16, 16, yeah. Somewhere around there, we met at a baby shower, actually, um, oddly enough, of a dear mutual friend of ours. And um, we discovered that we're both design historians and uh, both very interested in the arc of design for the arc of reproduction. So when we discovered that uh, common interest, we sort of locked in and had so much to talk about. And um, fast forward a couple of years, we decided to work on a book proposal together. And we were so confident that this was such a golden, golden idea. Um, and we kind of <laughs> approached the whole thing like, oh, these we're, we'll be fighting them off, all of these publishers. They will you know, want this project so badly because we just were so uh, confident in how brilliant the idea is. Hmm. Um, however, <laughs> Um, we did not get much um, traction there when we started sending out that book proposal. Mm -hmm. um, we were roundly rejected. Um, a common refrain was, uh, this is great. This is really interesting. It's not for us. We're not really sure who the audience is here. Um, we got a lot of flat out no's. Um, and mm -hmm. our entire premise was that this is a book for everybody because of course everyone has experienced um, in one sense or another um, the process of being born. Mm -hmm. So um, MIT was one of the first within like there was a week <laughs> we had a lucky week there where maybe MIT and a couple of other presses got in touch with us and this was post me too which we really think about as like okay the timing was right here um and um yeah MIT was one of the uh, presses that said you know what actually this is a very interesting idea um, and we have worked with brilliant people there, um, Victoria and um, Nicholas and all kinds of amazing people. Um, 
Michelle, do you want to take it? And Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to share some slides, actually. Yeah. It's the first time sharing on this platform. So um, if I'm not sharing correctly, you will let me know in a second. But can everyone see, or can you at least, Amber, see my slides here? Of if I'm just loading, but can you see them now? I can. Fantastic. Um, so I can't see your face as I'm doing this. So let me know or just okay. jump straight in and we can go back and forth. I think we are one brain at this point in okay. time. Um, so yeah, as Amber was saying, we were so lucky to connect with MIT. Um, we had begun uh, a couple years before that. And before it was a book, although that's what we knew we wanted it to be first, before it was an exhibition, two of which are currently live now, before any of the things that you see here as a public programs, design curriculum, story banking, we actually began it as an Instagram account because it was the only place that was uh, free and accessible to us to trade research. And so it began um, with a lot of this. This is Amber um, with jewels in her belly actually a couple of months ago, her baby blessing, um, and a lot of talking about objects like this. And so we began on Instagram because it was a way that we could trade research asynchronously. Um, uh, Amber has a very busy life and is often up in the wee hours with um, little ones or driving about various places. Um, I have a full-time job in a museum. And so- Michelle also is a very busy person. And so yeah, this. Instagram it was a way. Yeah, it was a way to be able to talk about the objects, yes, but also ideas and issues, um, larger design frameworks that really uh, we didn't see many places talking about, especially not in the places that we were as design historians, which was um, in museum exhibitions, museum collections, in, in places where design histories were being written or where they were being taught. And so this is a kind of a touchstone object for us both. Um, it's the, the breast pump, um, the A breast pump, I should say, from the mid 1950s. Um, and this became an important object for us in the story of how the book and how the project came to be. Um, if you haven't seen it before, it's from the mid 1950s, as it says here. Ina Egner was a Swedish civil design, uh, Swedish civil engineer, I should say. Um, and he was, so the story goes, he was at dinner one evening uh, with a gynecologist who was a friend of his, and the gynecologist challenged him to make a better breast pump. At the time, um, you certainly had uh, uh, hand breast pumps uh, made out of glass or, or other materials you could self-express, certainly with your own hands. Um, but if you were going to use a machine or mechanical breast pump, they were usually very big, very loud. You usually had to go to it rather than it coming to you. And so he did something that was really unusual for the time. And he went into a hospital, he talked to lactating people, and he said, what do you need? And he did that with Sister Maya Kinberg. So it was a co-design um, uh, designed by a woman and also um, by people who were actually going to use it. So he made it portable. You see the handle on the top. He made it much, much quieter. Um, and he made it more ergonomic in several ways. And so it was a design story that was particularly interesting to us. Um, I happened to be at MoMA at the time as a curatorial assistant. And so I said to my uh, colleagues at MoMA, I think we should bring this into the museum as part of the collection. It actually fit really nicely into this exhibition that you see here, Machine Art from 1934. Um, Machine Art was an exhibition it was the first exhibition really at the Museum of Modern Art of Design. Um, there'd been a, 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 an exhibition of architecture, contemporary architecture about two years earlier, but this was put together by Alfred Barr, who was the inaugural director of the museum, and Philip Johnson, the architect who had an outsized impact on architecture and design, not only at MoMA, but really in much of the uh, uh, European and North American uh, world for many, many decades. Here, they took machine-like objects, so the self-aligning ball bearing, the airplane propeller, um, glass beakers, springs, and they elevated them literally and metaphorically onto pedestals so that they looked like Brancusi sculptures. And so my argument was the breast pump looked the pot. It absolutely was part of this design language that was inherent to MoMA and had really permeated much of contemporary, modern contemporary design discourse ever since. It was also part of this wonderful trajectory of humble masterpieces. This is an exhibition that Paola Antonelli, the genius curator of contemporary design at MoMA still actually, um, created and curated in 2004. She brought back the, um, the uh, uh, self-aligning ball bearing just here. And she created an exhibition uh, that asked people to look at the everyday objects around them and to think about the ways in which these uh, objects like the big pen or the white t-shirt or the even the chubba chop lollipop had really important design history. So 
Amber and I were saying, you know, the, the breast pump isn't a million miles off that. Ina Agnell certainly, but then some of the other milestones, the mini electric, the hand pumps um, that really kind of augured this return into, um, or not return into, <laughs> people who lactate have always been part of the workforce, but uh, an increasing um, professionalization of um, mm -hmm. uh, workplaces that started to respond to the needs of new parents um, and lactating parents. Um, and then, of course, at this point in time, too, it was just a year after the Make the Breast Pump Not Suck hackathon that had happened at MIT at the Media Lab, um, where a brilliant group of people had brought together an even larger and more brilliant group of people to look at the breast pump and to think about the ways in which it could be um, uh, recreated, redesigned. They came back again in 2018 to think about how um, family leave could be redesigned as well. They started to think and started to understand that it's not just objects, but it's the systems around them. And those systems are designed very deliberately often by people around those, those uh, uh, material cultures. So all of this is a really long preamble to say um, we came to uh, uh, think about these objects very, very closely and very dearly through our Instagram. Um, and we thought that they should be in museum collections. Um, this is a little bit of what the Instagram uh, looked like, in fact, um, uh, and it's grown uh, uh, year upon year since we began it in 2019. This is the first post just here, Lucille Ball, wearing a rather wonderful tie waist skirt. Um, maternity garments are definitely uh, a thread through the book and the exhibition and something that Amber and I have both thought about for a really, really long time. Um, long, long, long way of saying, though, that um, we were told that, no, this wouldn't be something that we could bring into a museum collection. And as we got more and more of those no answers, we realized that it wasn't going to be an art institution that we would partner with. It would have to be somebody else. And that was a moment in time we got really lucky. And Amber, maybe I hand the story back to you of how we got in touch with MCC. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um... Yeah, so um, we were looking for partners and we had been, MIT again, just to circle back around, was interested, um, but I think we needed more, we needed to kind of develop the partnership outside of just MIT. And so uh, a dear colleague of ours in Philadelphia, Erica Debrea, suggested to us that we get in touch with the Maternity Care Coalition, who's a wonderful 40-year-old um, institution, really, and thought leaders in uh, child and maternal health um, in Pennsylvania. And so um, the day before the Pew application was due, um, Michelle, who was working at uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art at the time, turned up on their doorstep and met with uh, Karen here and Zoe. Um, what is Karen's um, title? Well, Karen I'm is the VP of Outreach at MCC, yeah. and Zoe was at the time the executive assistant and who has become since the amazing curatorial assistant on the yeah. Designing Motherhood project. We call her the glue because she <laughs> keeps everything and everyone stuck together and moving and has been brilliant at every stage of the process. Anyway, long story short, um, we described the project to them and though they didn't quite, they said, we're not really entirely sure what this is all about, but yes, we, we'd like to, you know, partner with you and move forward. So um, we got that application together literally in 24 hours time and to our collective great surprise, um, the Pew Foundation granted us um, th this wonderful arts and heritage grant and the project all of a sudden bloomed and um, and MIT <laughs> signed off and um, the rest is sort of history. And so we have amazing collaborators, which we should absolutely name as part of yes. our process here. And they're not even all in this PowerPoint, but we, <laughs> along the way, um, we're so lucky to have Dr. Juliana Rowan Barton, who's a design specialist, especially in um, uh, mid-century design. Uh, she joined our team as an associate curator, Gabriella Nelson. Um, you see an image here on the right. It's of Gabriella breastfeeding her son, August. We saw this on Maternity Care Coalition's Instagram. Um, Gabriella is the associate director of policy and advocacy at Maternity 
Maternity Care Coalition. Um, and when we saw this image, we were it, right in the middle of doing the picture research for the feeding section of the book. And we said, oh my goodness, we have to have this image. Maybe we can reach out to this person and ask their permission. Um, and that started this really magical conversation with Gabriella, who's trained as a city planner as well. And so she immediately got the design context and was so eloquently and nimbly able to connect it, um, as she does every day in her job, to the context of maternal and infant advocacy and policy. Um, mm -hmm. On the right, you see her amazing uh, niece, Bella, who's been part of the project on our shoot days um, and at other kind of uh, uh, pivotal moments. And then we also have this amazing group of just a brain trust of people who Again, we're super lucky to work with um, all of the folks that you see here, Adrian Edwards, Portia Holland, Dakara Ganey, and Sabrina Taylor, um, they work at MCC. Um, or actually, uh, Portia has just left MCC, but um, they work as either doulas or lactation consultants or early childhood education specialists. They're also laureled outside of that institution. Um, Sabrina is a children's book author. Um, uh, Takara, for example, is an anthropologist. Um, each one of them- to be a midwife. Um, studying to be a midwife. Yes, yeah, yeah. nursing. Yes, absolutely. And so um, they have at each step of the project, and so we brought them together as the advisory committee or advisors, really, for the um, the project from its inception. And they have really guided thinking about the ways in which we approach certain topics, the ways in which we've thought about the exhibition design, the book content, um, really every single part of it to make sure that we are true partners with Maternity Care Coalition um, and that we are centering the expertise of amazing um, people who are doing the direct service work that MCC does every single day. And that work you can see a little bit of here. They've been in Philadelphia um, for 40 years or so. Um, one of their signature programs is the Mom Mobile. Um, you see a sort of early 1980s version of it up top and the more recent version down below. Um, they operate what they call a client-centered approach. So they they really listen to the needs of each individual client and they do so by having advocates um, go visit people in their homes. This is not such a radical idea if you are somewhere like the Netherlands, but in the incredibly piecemeal offering that um, the US healthcare system is, and given the fact that um, infant and uh, maternal health outcomes are really disparate in terms of um, uh, in terms of those outcomes, based on things like uh, socioeconomic standing, uh, uh, based on one's race, um, they really think about meeting uh, birthing people um, and uh, people in general across any uh, moment of their arc of human reproduction, where they are, and thinking about what they need, and so. This is a, a, an MCC home visit today that you see on the left uh, and one from the 1980s, early 1980s uh, on the right. And we argued when we um, spoke with them that it, it really was a form of um, a civic design about city planning right from the ground up um, and that their work should be better known. Um, I think I'd been in Philly for a couple of years by that point in time and I had not heard of them before um, and we really hoped one of the goals, uh, mutual goals for our project, the book, the exhibitions and all of the attendant parts of it was to be able to bring attention to the amazing work that they had been doing. Um, another part of it was also to elevate um, midwifery, to elevate this expertise that had been um, the expertise uh, mainly of uh, women of color in this country and beyond um, for many, many centuries, let alone decades, and something that had been marginalized um, uh, excessively over the 20th century. Um, we talk about it in lots of ways in the book um, and in the exhibition. This is one of our favorites. Amber, do you want to, yeah. to introduce this one? Absolutely. Yeah, this is um, a gem from our project um, and is in our exhibition at the Mütter Museum, as well as mm -hmm. um, there in an essay in our book. And that's the film All My Babies, A Midwife's Own Story, um, which was directed by George Stoney in 1953 in Albany, Georgia. Um, and it really stands out for the way it depicts and uplifts the role of the black midwife. Um, Mary Coley is the film's central protagonist. And there's just great compassion and sensitivity in the way that the director, George Stoney, shows um, Mary Coley. And he was inspired, in fact, by an um, Italian neorealist film in which directors followed non-actors around through loosely scripted activities and allowed for uh, a sense of the organic, really. Um, so actual in this film, actual homes and street scenes and actual prenatal visits and a birth were shown. 
Um, and meanwhile, Mary Coley brings her high level of skills, uh, cultural traditions, and just, um, yeah, really her culturally appropriate care work, which is something that MCC advocates so strongly for um, to her work every single day. And um, the unfortunate aspect of the film is that it also foreshadows the demise of black midwifery as hospital birth became more prevalent in the US. Um, and this is a, a, a moment, the film shows a rare moment in which care like Mary Coley's coexisted with the growing medical industrial complex. And we have a number of um, objects within both the book as well as the exhibitions that trace this move from how home birth was replaced by hospital birth and midwifery replaced by obstetric care and uh, more of this, uh, yeah, the medical industrial complex. And it, at the beginning of the century, uh, home birth was the dominant way in which people birthed. Only 1% of people gave birth in the hospital. And by the end of the century, that had completely flipped. So 99% of people, um, and that's true today too, 99% of people give birth in hospitals, 1% at home. So we've been incredibly lucky to have this. Um, I mean, it comes back to the saying, it truly takes a village. And it has for this particular project. Um, these are amazing partners. Um, I will say that, you know, uh, I have a full-time institutional job. Um, Amber has a full-time independent job. Uh, neither one of us have been able to do the Designing Motherhood project during our working hours. Um, it wasn't welcomed in institutions, at least none of the ones that I was working for. Um, and then for Amber during the pandemic, her entire life has been taken up making sure that um, small humans stay alive and are nourished. Um, and so I think it's important to to recognize the folks on this screen because they have made it possible in our evenings and weekends, um, but also to, to, to fund and to pay all of the other collaborators that we've had that have been magnificent, brilliant people with design expertise, our book designers, our exhibition designers, and all of the 50 plus contributors to the book as well. So um, this is a little bit of, if you don't have it in front of you, this is a bit of what the book looks like. Um, we have 80 or so chapters that run over um, four uh, subsections. So we look at uh, reproduction, uh, pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Uh, we look at designed objects, certainly, but also systems. And then at 26 different stages throughout the book, we either have spreads um, that welcome an artist uh, into the picture um, or a documentary photographer, or in some cases, they go through archival materials, fine photographs, and even, even family photographs from many people on our team. Um, we talk about many, many, many different designs through it, and these are just a few to kind of whet the appetite here. Um, we talk about the at-home pregnancy test designed by a graphic designer, Meg Crane, who was a, a, an expert in packaging design actually at Organon, um, a pharmaceutical company here in the US. In 1969, 1970, she looked at a row of test tubes, which is basically what you just see here in a lab that was attached to her offices um, at Organon. Uh, she was very well versed in creating packaging for many over-the-counter um, uh, 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 pharmaceuticals. And and she looked at a row of lab tests, asked a colleague what was going on with them, and he said, oh, you know, they're pregnancy tests, the urine samples that get tested here, they get sent back to the doctor, and then they'll eventually go back to the person who's who's um, asked to be tested. Um, and that process can take a good couple of weeks. And she said, oh, you know, I think those people could probably do it themselves. So she decided to package it, and that's how we ended up with the pregnancy test, not without a few stumbles along the way in terms of her actually being able to have agency over this design within her company. She was poo-pooed many times. She was told that, you know, business shouldn't be taken out of the hands of doctors, um, that people People wouldn't be able to test themselves for pregnancy. They needed the expertise of doctors. Um, so it was no easy journey by any means. On the right-hand side here is the first biodegradable flushable pregnancy test um, designed by two amazing young women in Philadelphia, actually, over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, Amber, do you want to chat about this one or shall I? Um, go for it. And we have that wonderful quote, I think, coming up as well, which I think okay. tells a lot of the story. Fantastic. So the Delcon Shield, many of you may have seen this before. We were really, um, I won't say happy, but it was very fortunate that 
the Mutter Museum exhibition, one of the exhibitions that we have for Designing Motherhood, um, has one of these in their collection. So we were able to bring out a range of intrauterine devices, IUDs and contraceptive devices, um, and pop them on display. This is one that was used and developed and used in the 1970s, um, and, uh, deployed on, on millions of women. Um, and uh, it was uh, had a, a fairly significant design flaw, um, which was that the wick just here, instead of being a monofilament, was multifilament, which allowed bacteria to go up it into somebody's, um, through somebody's cervix and into their uterus. And the best possible outcome is that they had really horrific pain from pelvic inflammatory disease. Uh, the worst possible outcome was sepsis and death. One of the really important people who um, spoke up about their experiences with this particular design was the reproductive justice pioneer Loretta Ross. Um, she had this uh, IUD implanted. Uh, she went back repeatedly over six months to her doctor saying that she had unbearable pain. She was dismissed. Um, it looks like until, Michelle. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, it looks like you've just froze for just an instant there. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Fantastic. I was just uh, saying it, uh, she she only was able to have the mm. medical attention she needed when um, she uh, went into sep septic shock, went into a coma and was rushed to the hospital. And so here in her own words, she talks about having uh, a hysterectomy, hysterectomy sorry, performed without her permission um, and without her knowledge because she was unconscious um, and really fighting from then on to make sure that others did not have um, the same issue of not being able to have informed consent around any part of their reproductive arc. Um, so the Dalcon Shield has become sort of a design in many ways that is a, a, a beacon of the reproductive justice movement. And it's and so interesting, interesting, sorry, so interesting to read in the chat, it looks like ER um, just chatted that uh, Loretta Ross is actually a graduate of Agnes Scott College, which is where Karis uh, mm. is located. Mm -hmm. So it's so mm -hmm. interesting to just make all of these connections. Lots awesome. of lots of Georgia here tonight. Um, yeah, if there's anything coming up in the chat, I cannot see it. Yeah. But if there's questions that are coming in or anything along yeah, those lines, please. Yeah. Please, um, I will. I'll shout out. <laughs> great. Um, so yeah, this is for you know many might already know this um, particular definition, but reproductive justice just allows uh, for personal bod bodily autonomy throughout the reproductive arc. Um, we also talk about uh, postpartum uh, designs, and Amber, I feel like this is a great one for you to chat about because you're right in it right now. Yes, it's true. Um, I was telling ER at the beginning uh, in the green room that um, I had a baby six weeks ago, so I'm definitely, this is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart just now. Has been for a while, but it's been really interesting to live it after writing about it, of course. Um, so, and that is postpartum care. And we call this chapter in the book Cramsorg because that is kind of a, the zenith design concept for us. Um, and that is, the Cramsorg, for those of you who don't know, um, is a person in the Netherlands, a person who comes to one's home um, and is kind of like a through line of support for both the mother and baby in those tender days, weeks, and months of uh, postpartum. Um, and to have somebody doing home visits like that, who's an expert in uh, all of the myriad issues that may and do come up is just so incredible. And that's why, we, you know, MCC again, um, we laud their work so much because they've been a Band-Aid solution for that, uh, for what's missing in the U.S., but that, of course, is provided in, the, in uh, countries like the Netherlands. And we look at a range of objects, really. Um, Michelle, do you want to talk about the Rea Pessary? Sure, yeah, absolutely. This is one of my favorites. Um, it's You can see it on display here at the Mutter Museum. So it's this little object just here alongside some of its early prototypes, which the team um, really brilliantly called uh, the Frankenstein designs. And then next is some real Frankensteins um, uh, beside it. So a pessary is something that, um, well, a pessary can be many things, but in this case, it's uh, keeping one's um, uterus in place. And so 
a statistic that we didn't know until we started working with the designers behind Raya Pessary was that one in two people um, who have a uterus at some point will experience some kind of pelvic prolapse, which is when your uterus departs from where it is and gravity takes over and it comes mm -hmm. through your cervix. Um, it can be greater or lesser in severity, um, but it's something that's quite taboo still culturally to talk about. Um, and they were challenged, they came together actually uh, when they were engineering students in a class at Cornell, they were asked to um, think of a patent or look for a patent that hadn't been shown some attention in a while. Um, they settled on the pessary, at least in US patents, that hadn't had a remake uh, since 1938. Um, they attributed cultural attitudes to this uh, fact that the people had not looked, uh, had not designed in this space. Also, the, the attitude that we found actually throughout the book that often, um, quote unquote, women's issues or reproductive Productive issues, uh, regardless of gender, um, are, are often thought about as either too taboo to design for or to talk about within design classes. A big, big gap is that this just isn't something that designers are taught about in their studios um, as students, uh, or that it's just not seen as something that can be lucrative or a money maker, which is just not the case given, I mean, the statistic speaks for itself, one in two people with a uterus will have some experience with a pelvic prolapse. So they moved from um, the many, many, many design objects that have been created over time as passeries, which originally could have been as simple as a pomegranate or a ball of wool that you put into your vagina. Um, they bypassed uh, some of the much more uncomfortable looking objects that you see from the Mutter's historic collection that were wooden or metal in nature. And they created this really wonderful silicon, collapsible silicon um, passerie that's a little bit like inserting a tampon. And the really wonderful thing is that they want people to be able to use it themselves. So instead of having to go into a provider's office, which is sometimes the case for it to be used is something that can take be taken in and out very easily um, by somebody for either sex or sleeping or, or whatever the case may be so we went from a project where we had um many 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 no's <laughs> right amber so many no's so, so many no's. <laughs> all the no's um and we still get no's all the time like it's not like yeah. a stranger to no's anymore but it's, I mean, it's humbling but yeah we humbling. we press on <laughs> We've had so many yeses. And so, you know, one of those yeses is being invited to somewhere as amazing as, as Karis, where, you know, yeah. it's sort of a really historical place to share a book like okay. this. Um, and then, you know, the the outlets that have been kind enough to cover this. Um, it's the first time we'd seen the term menstrual cups um, in the New York Times uh, uh, headline. It's the first time we'd seen uh, something like medical racism or midwifery in, in the Mutter Museum, for example, yeah. too. Um, not, not to the fault of their curators who are amazing and, and really forward thinking and actually had been trying to get a show like this on the books for a really long time, but again, had sort of been combating some cultural and maybe internal taboos of their own. And so it's been really interesting to a have some more yeses because those yeses have really kind of grown as more people have said yes this somehow reflects my experience where i'm interested in it but also to see where those no's remain because i think that's there's a fair bit of cultural resistance still to these conversations mm -hmm. and it's interesting to see where it comes from um this is a little bit of what the exhibitions look like if you're in philly we'd, we'd love you to come and see them um the Mutter Museum is open until next uh, uh, May, so May of 2022. The Centre for Architecture is coming down in just a few weeks on November 14. Um, in the Mutter presentation, we've worked with their historical collection and been able to connect it to contemporary designs. Um, so it's a little bit of um, old meets new design. In the um, Centre for Architecture, we're really looking at the last 70 years or so of design. And Amber, myself, Juliana, Gabriella, Zoe have um, done a a lot of eBay searching, actually, a lot of uh, <laughs> online sleuthing because so much of this is not held in collections. Um, and so we've we've done a lot of um, uh, pulling together a checklist that in any other exhibition, we would have been able to look to somebody's uh, or an institution's collection to pull from. Um, we also commissioned three really fantastic contemporary artists who have worked with and, uh, and, and very directly with the Maternity Care Coalition, the four advisors that we showed at the beginning of um, the PowerPoint slides. So Michelle Angela Ortiz, Helena Metaferia, and um, Alison Crony Moses. Um, a lot of their conversations have been with um, either the direct service staff at Maternity Care Coalition and elevating their voices, their presence, their portraits in some cases, um, or um, speaking to the experiences of um, folks who have had experiences across the reproductive arc. So maybe this is a good place to end, right, Amber, thinking about um, 
the way in which we've defined motherhood and thinking about the book, this term is right there on our book cover. And we really struggled with it, really, really, really struggled with it for a long time. Um, we wanted to think about ways in which we could um, bring together in a legible sense the objects and ideas and issues and frameworks and systems that we were obsessed by as design historians. But we also uh, very much realized the um, the potential for exclusion of experiences, the, the difficulty, the naughtiness of motherhood as a term. And we explore that in depth in many, many, many areas it, we, throughout it. It, it is a it's, a, it's a common thread throughout the book, thinking about critiquing, wrestling with, talking about um, what we mean when we say the term or use the term motherhood. And so this is the um, short glossary uh, entry that we ended up writing um, uh, and, and putting out as part of the, the exhibitions. Um, and it's also in the book too. So we think about it as beyond a gender binary, beyond people who've been pregnant or given birth. I haven't, so I, 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 I do not have children myself. Um, it's a descriptor that can be embodied, deferred, refused, taken on as a duty or expectation, or otherwise engaged with in all of its knotty contours. Um, motherhood is very definitely myriad. Um, I, does that sound, seem like a good place for us to end our slides, Amber? I think so. I think that covers a lot of ground. Fantastic. And I think I am, I am still screen sharing and I'm going to figure out, I'm going to stop sharing just here. Perfect. I did it. Wonderful. <laughs> um, my first time using this particular platform. Um, but yeah, so, and thank you. Um, yeah, you like that definition. Good. We, we, we thought long and hard about it and um, had the huge benefit of so many other contributors to the book being able to offer their own definitions, talk about their own experiences. One chapter that stands out for us often is um, Thomas Beatty, who gave birth to three of his four children. Um, he, and he talked about the importance of language, um, specifically in his case, the language on a birth certificate. Um, he spoke of the experience of having his uh, first child, a, a son, Austin, in 2008, I think. And um, the person who registers births coming around to his hospital room and registering him and saying, well, as the birthing person, I can only put your name in where the mother's entry is on the certificate. And quite obviously, Thomas um, went through this journey to become a father. He is a father. That's his identification. He identifies as man. And so... Um, this was, uh, I mean, there was a whole traumatic path to to, to fatherhood in his case anyway, given um, the, the fairly hostile um, medical world in, in terms of um, many people's experiences, but certainly his. Um, and he very successfully went to court um, and, and, and really tenaciously uh, had the law changed so he could be recognized as what he is and was at the time of his son's birth and subsequent children's births, which is the birthing father. Um, so for us, the, the definition is important um, and it takes us to this conversation that happens throughout the book about design of language. Um, mm -hmm. So objects are very definitely there. It's a very visual book, um, but it's also very invested in thinking about the um, the the importance of how we design language too yeah absolutely so i'm thinking amber i don't know if we have any questions for each other i feel like i mean we talk about these yeah. ideas and thoughts all of the time um uh it's been our constant you know connection over years now <laughs> at least two of the births of your children and like three different jobs for me so it's been a long <laughs> wow oh, i didn't think about it like that we think that um yeah we're, we're deeply honored to be in this feminist space thinking about these ideas um and i think i i hope I know that we, I mean, we stand on the shoulders of so many others making this book, um, certainly many, many feminist thinkers who are quoted liberally in the book itself. Um, I don't know if we would say we would subscribe to any specific strands of or histories of feminism apart from just deep intersectionality. And I think that, again, comes from the many different contributors to the book. Um, we're really lucky to have multiple voices. And um, we did that very deliberately because we understand that wild birth is something that everybody experiences because that's how we all got here. Um, the experience then becomes extremely unique from that point onwards. So we hope if people do pick up the book, if they do think it's something that's of interest to them, that they find their own um, experiences somewhere reflected in there, but also have a moment where they recognize the experiences of somebody else that might have been a, a 
up until then unknown to them, invisible to them, um, or, you know, a design history that allows them to understand the mature culture in which we exist and the world of objects and systems in which we exist as um, deeply political, deeply feminist and deeply important to consider. Yeah, I love that. I love what you just said about um, hoping that readers find themselves within the book and hoping that they also find experiences very much outside of themselves. Um, that's so important. And I think it goes into our broader definition of motherhood, which is really just to build empathy for each other and for this really common Ex life experience that we all undergo. So that's really beautiful. I'm sitting here tonight at my museum, Amber. You're sitting in your home. And yeah. I feel like this is the two sides of the same coin. And maybe that's where we'll, we'll end it because yeah. these have been really, at least in our experience and so many of the experiences of our peers, really freighted spaces. Yeah. Um, the domestic space, I think, has been particularly hard for anybody with care responsibilities over the last year and a half, but always, actually, there's a long history. <laughs> Didn't just take a pandemic for it to be hard in that space. And one of the reasons we started this project in the first place is that a space like this, and my God, I love them because I've worked in museums now for over, over 15 years, but this was not a space that was particularly, and I don't mean this is specific to the MFA where I am, but museums in general, although you know, I think every museum could do better, including our museum, um, was just not a welcoming place for people with families, with people with care responsibilities, old or young, um, with people with, with family lives. I think that goes for US working culture more generally. Um, but it is and our likewise, right? I mean, likewise, you know, um, I think we talk about this as well is that, um, your experience working so hard has sort of uh made the okay. made this made your experience difficult to want to grow your family, right? I mean, okay. it, yeah, no, absolutely. Like, the um, I mean, <laughs> I'm at the museum at 8 30 on a Saturday night. <laughs> And that, that has been because it's been a full work day. Yes, you're today. laughing. <laughs> and I love it because I'm with you. So, I mean, like we get to have these conversations. But yes, I I, I mean, it, it is really hard to have a child. I mean, the prerequisite one is that I like hang out with my husband from time to time. Um, <laughs> and prerequisite two is that you are able to have a semblance of work-life balance. Um, or actually, I don't think the balance part exists, but that you are able to um, find space for whatever you just define as family within a working life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think museums for all of their missions of inclusivity and accessibility still have a really, really long way to go, as do many other workplaces in the US. Absolutely. I mean, I've just been dipping into also the whole child care debate that's happening right now and how that is just absolutely unsustainable um, in the U.S. So it's not just museums. It's not just, you know, these yeah. siloed professions. I mean, it's a, it's a whole system. everywhere. Yeah. situation that needs improvement and that's you know something that I'm really proud of in our book is that we do look at the design of systems not just objects but also of systems that either support or just completely leave um, parenting families out in the rain yeah and and everyone I feel like yeah we think everyone. about and everyone as a, as a labor solidarity as a as a yeah just a a right that everybody should have a workplace in which they can define their family needs and their personal needs um, in the way that is healthy for them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, on that note, I think that sort of brings us, we were meant to close at around mm -hmm. 8.30. So I know that that sort of feels like maybe a, right? I, a good, <laughs> I'm making, I don't know, like a, 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 no. a, a placenta shape. Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you both so much. This is lovely. Um, you know, I think one of the things I, I am very much a design nerd, so I'm very excited about about the unity of, of two areas of interest of mine in this one book. Um, and I think folks, you know, it doesn't surprise me that this book was hard to place with a publisher, right? Um, yeah. For all of the reasons that you enumerated, but I think um, the more the more people see books like this in the marketplace, the more there will be future books like this in the marketplace. So yeah. I do think, you know, design books are still so, that's still such a masculine sphere. Um, particularly, 
percent. Eighty-six percent of graphic design. I think that I think that's the uh, the statistic. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, uh, it doesn't surprise me. Um, and even yeah, I mean, it's so many art books, with the exception of interior design, maybe. But even interior design is still pretty male. So yeah, pretty yeah. male. So I mean, it feels um, it feels really important, you know, to honor this as this unity of content and form because exactly. it's not just it's not just what's inside the book but even just where it exists in the marketplace yeah. um and uh i think folks who are not sort of paying attention to publishing just may not understand that um so i do want to encourage folks to buy designing motherhood um things that make and break our births ideally please buy it from karis it does really help us when you buy your event books from us uh, you can click this teal button at the bottom center of your screen to buy it. Uh, it makes a very great gift, we think, for new parents, um, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, just people who are interested in design and people who are interested in art and, you know, sort of the world of things. Um, I think I think lots of people would, would really enjoy this. So um, click that button tonight or sometime soon and... Um, I want to make sure I put the designing motherhood Instagram in the chat, mm -hmm. but is there any other place that you would like folks to engage with your work? Like what? A really good question. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we'd also love people to know about maternity care coalition. Mm -hmm. um, and we post about them so often on um, Instagram. Um, so there's definitely, there's links there. Um, if you go to designingmotherhood.org as well, which is our website, you can see a full list of project collaborators. In fact, it's not even a full list because there's too many people to mention. But you can find a lot of them, including our advisors who are amazing folks. And so, um, yes, it, that, that's a really good place to at least start. And from there, there's some other um, reading materials and other links to podcasts that we've done that help sort of um, branch out into other areas too. Awesome. And if folks, uh, since we mentioned Loretta Ross tonight, um, we have all of Loretta Ross's books at Karis. And of course, Loretta Ross is an alum of Agnes Guy College and um, and so so key and pivotal um, in the movement for reproductive justice and reproductive rights. So um, if you don't know her work, check out her work um, as well as, as additional reading. Uh, to, to benefit the the reading of this book because um, she, she gave us so many um, tools and so many different kinds of language that we didn't have before. So um, mm -hmm. thank you both so much. I really enjoyed this and enjoyed talking to you. Um, I hope that you stay safe and well during this pandemic time and beyond. Um, and maybe hopefully you can come visit us in person at some time. That would be amazing. amazing. Yeah, right. thank you for having us. Thank you to everyone who came along. Take care. Good night.